Hello, Nate. Hello, Greg. Hello, all the people out there on the internet. Uh, we are here once again. Welcome to What's This Bird Live, a product of the American Birding Association, going live on the ABA's various social media feeds, namely YouTube and Facebook. Hello, it's great to see all of you here out there. Hello, Greg. How is your spring going? Do you have snow on the ground <laughs> as you did that last time around? We do. We, we had do. we had a we, we had in between the last time it went up into the 70s. Um yep. 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 and the trumpet honeysuckle uh popped out in leaf and so did the the a uh, bunch of other stuff and now we've got I don't know some at least a good covering maybe a quarter inch of snow on the ground. Um, oh, well, look at that. We're, we're, we're but... into spring here. It is, it is spring. The hen bit is coming up in my yard. The, uh, the little, uh, you know, I forget the, the violet flowers I've, whose name escapes me. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, those would be called violets. Over the place. No, 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 they're not. They're, they're I that's the color. I... Well, we do have violets, but there's this, <laughs> I, I don't know why I can't remember the name. I'll tell you. Hello from everybody out there. <laughs> we're excited to see your Marsha Blestry in Ocean Pines, Maryland, commenting on YouTube, Debbie Holsgraf, John. Anderson from rainy Olympia, Washington. Is there any other type of uh, weather in Olympia, Washington? Not, uh, not if the, the the pop culture would have me believe. Um, yeah. Yes, it's uh, it's spring. I've got Carolina wrens in my garage and house finches on my porch, and they are all doing their thing. We've got uh, Gavin popping in to say hi on Facebook. Hey, so just be before we before we get into it, just want to uh, tell you what we do here. If this is your first time, um, yes. we run a couple of groups called What's This Bird? One on Facebook and one in our own ABA community. And um, I go through there uh, every couple of weeks and we pick out some, uh, we pick out birds that are interesting for whatever reason mm -hmm. appeals to us. And then we throw them up here and we talk about them. Um, we pick through the ID and uh, any other things that come to mind, really. Um, Absolutely. One of the cool things about what's this bird is that uh, every year we, we can kind of tell the seasons by what bird, yeah. birds people are seeing and are curious about. So uh, we'll try and pick some birds that are uh, relevant to your current birding situation, which is uh, here in March and late March. It will be, uh, I don't know, <laughs> like uh, birds that are molting, birds that are migrating, birds that are uh, doing early breeding season things and might look a little ragged. Uh, a yep. lot of a lot of birds going. I say, you know, there's no bad time of year to bird. So I will say March is, uh, is probably Kelly Christmas. Smith from Ontario, <laughs> New York says hi. And um, Wait, Kelly Smith, our our colleague. No, not that Kelly Smith. Um, Kelly Kelly uh, Mantello Smith. Um, a lot of, a lot and Kelly so Smith does so Cindy Glasgow Breidenbach. British soccer player named Kelly Smith. And Mia's yeah. here, of course. Hey, Mia. But she's got to go. Ah, uh, oh well. Go Good to her. see you, Mia. Um, but the, uh, the the part of saying hello to everybody is to let you guys know that we watch the comments and if there's something you want right. if there's something you want to talk about or a question you have pop it in there and we will do the best we can to get to it uh, in the time we have. Yeah, Tony Diamond on YouTube, one foot of snow in the ground in New Brunswick. Uh, more coming this weekend. First Junkos yesterday. Well. I, interestingly enough, I had probably my last Junkos uh, last week, so uh, they're they're somewhere in the middle between uh, New Brunswick and North Carolina, which is pretty. Yeah, I haven't seen Junkos around because there's been. I mean, we we have insects and things, or at least we did last mm -hmm. week. Um, but now with snow on the ground, I saw Junkos in the yard for the first time because they're looking looking for the feeder, which is empty, unfortunately, but they'll be fine. Um, yeah. a lot of a lot of native food out there right now, natural food, I should say. Yeah, so um, uh, Alex uh, Cruz Chisnall says, "Well, I don't know I, what's a what's a dollar sign. That's uh, uh, four inches the, uh, of snow in the Twin Cities. Four inches. I thought that was some sort of weird conversion rate. If we were going to have to do that conversion <laughs> between, there it is. He fixed it. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> um, yeah. So you know, we've got a lot of birds to get to." Um, so why don't we why don't we just pop right into that? Uh, yeah, we've got plenty of people here in the chat. Um, and as always, as Greg said, we just want to reiterate it. If you have any questions, comments, uh, interesting observations, things you want to share with the class, uh, please let us know. We will call them out and talk about them. Doesn't take much to get us to talk about birds, although we are here to talk specifically 
about the uh, half dozen or so photos that Greg has pulled from our various What's This Bird groups to chat about. It's a it's a it's a smorgasbord of smorgasbord of uh, early spring. Uh, interesting. Too early for here. that. <laughs> Too early. But while we're we are well while we are now. talking about while we are <laughs> talking about things, I want to talk about OM system. Um which is some top notch camera kit if you are at all familiar. If you are not, get on the Google and hit OM system. Um this is great kit for birders. I use it. Um I'm I've used everything. I, this is right as good or better than anything I've used. I shot professionally for a while. Um, and ABA members can get a 10% discount. Um, you can use your phone and hit that QR code, or if you're a member, you can get into your member portal on our website um, and get a 10% discount, which on uh, camera gear is... Depending on what you get, uh, yeah. it pays for your ABA membership a few times over. <laughs> I would say so, and um, yeah. it's it's good stuff. Plus, you get magazines and access to our various, uh, you know, we've got a magazine archive. You can go back and look at all the birding magazines for the entire history of the organization. We've got an identification portal where we well, have pulled out a lot of the really cool identification, uh, bird identification articles that have been published in various ABA magazines over the years and peruse those at your discretion uh, if you need them. And also access to things like uh, ABA community and various other uh, members only uh, members only things that we we offer um so check that out uh, along with your when you're you know purchasing your new uh lens from om system and we also uh in that aba member portal have discounts from all kinds of other uh companies that are uh partners and friends of the aba like cornell yeah. birds of the world you get a discount oh, yeah. there. cornell who's who's uh online stuff are uh are working well, they're now, back up so they're go, back up. Go, yeah, go, go, feel free to feel free to head over there. You could you could oh, put oh. the knives and and things away. Cornell is back up, um, but also Mike Beauty Curley o says that he just got his OM1 MK2 and 40 to 100 Pro lens yesterday. So using that ABA membership, right get it. on. Um, yeah, that, that that's the OM1 is uh, the I'm sorry. Yeah, the OM1 Mark II is. My next, uh, my next little, my little bit of purchase that's coming up here. Um, all right, we made our sponsors right. happy, Greg. Let's talk some birds. Let's talk some birds. All right, this one comes from Carlisle, Illinois, and it wasn't posted in What's This Bird. It was posted in the Illinois Birders Forum. And uh, you know, when I when I sit here working at my desk, my phone is over here to the right on a stand, plugged into everything, and I kind of use it as a fourth monitor. And while we were Literally in a staff meeting, that bird popped up and I glanced over at it and just shot off. Um, Rough-legged hawk is correct. And it is not Is that what the original hawk. observer uh, thought it was? No, they weren't hawk? sure. They weren't sure. But rough sure. leg was definitely one. But there were there were a lot of guesses. I mean, there were turkey vulture and all kinds of things. Um, yeah, that's certainly not a turkey vulture. But it is but, not a rough-legged um, hawk. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut to the comp here. Um, because, um, it is a Harlan's red tailed hawk. And we're going to talk for in a second here about why it is, um, a Harlan's red tailed hawk. But before we do that, I want to talk about first impressions and what they can do to you. Because, um, you know, I've seen a lot of, I've seen a, a fair number of Harlan's and I've seen a lot of rough legs. It's a bird, you know, well, I don't know what I saw about that bird on the left that immediately made me think dark phase rough leg. It may have been the tail band. It may have, uh, yeah. who knows? I, I mean, I look, don't... The, superficially, those two those two birds look very similar, for sure. They are. There's, there's they no are. Doubt. That's a tough, and that can be a tough ID. Absolutely. But, but I mean, I, I identified it with a confidence that I didn't really have in <laughs> hindsight. Oh, we've all been there. No, yeah. I know, I know. And But that's that's a real pitfall of birding, no matter how long you've been doing it is mm -hmm. you get a bird that you know you you think you know you pop it off and then you're like oh I, you know it's it's hard to look at something that you think you know with fresh eyes every time yeah, and that is true. that's how a lot of there was there was a 
a really famous case of, at least in my neck of the woods, of a red cockaded woodpecker found in northern Illinois. Mm-hmm. And I guess a couple people or more had looked at it and just immediately, based on size, called it a downy and didn't even look at it. Yeah. And one person is like, wait, that's not a downy woodpecker. And that's happened before. And there was a there was a, a juvenile uh, skylark in California that yeah. several people called a Smith's Longspur. I mean, big names. Oh uh, yeah, a there was Longspur. there's a, a famous story of a uh, of a juvenile horned lark. You know, famously one of the probably one of the most mistaken birds in in North America, yeah. maybe even around the world since it's whole Arctic. But uh, yeah, it was originally identified as as a Sprague's pipit, which is not an uncommon. Uh, that's not, not uncommon. uncommon. Yeah, but it ended but, up being a it ended up being a horned lark. But yeah, that, I mean that stuff. But yeah, yeah and your as, brain as decides Tim, what something is, it can be very difficult to kind of go back and and um and fix that. Ab- absolutely, and Tim Kalbach says with um uh very confidently, uh, confidence is a double edged sword, and he is correct. Oh, no doubt, um, no doubt. But so, I will say so, when. I mean, do you have something to add? Sorry, I don't want to talk over you. No, no, no. I was just I was going to start talking about the picture here. Oh yeah, well I'll, I'll I'll just give my impression because I want you. Yeah. I'll give you the last word on this. Um, when you sent me the photos, the the slideshow to kind of, you know, look at some of the birds that we were going to talk about today, um, and I saw this one pop up. My first impression, just based on the, my gut reaction of this bird, was red-tailed hawk, and, and that that goes to show that you know I've seen thousands upon thousands of red-tailed hawks in my birding career, as many many birders have. Um, I just got that impression, but it's one of those birds that it's different enough. Like even as, as Harlan's go, this does, and you can tell me if I'm wrong here, this does look like a very dark Harlan's like this is on the darker end of the spectrum for Harlan's, which can kind of run the gamut from, you know, very it dark is, but birds. It's, to, it's to you know, looking bit. at it bigger, you know, looking at it bigger, it's got the white mm-hmm. modeling on the chest, which my brain just didn't even register. Um, yeah. I, and, you know, and, yeah, I looked at it and it was the it's the shape of the wings that sort of does it for me. You know, red winged hawks yes. kind of have that classic, very broad winged, deep belly uh, to the wings, and and the like. You know, the secondaries kind of bulge all the way, you know, halfway down the tail when you see them flying. Yep. They look like they're and the short like hand a kite more than a bird, uh, like a kite, like the flying instrument, not the not the bird, and a yeah. short hand exactly. And so it gives you a very it's... broad based look. And uh, that's what I thought, but you know, this bird is so different from the red-tailed hawks I typically see because I I live in the southeast, so all of our red-tailed hawks are pretty much the nominant birds. We very rarely see birds that are that you know diverge from that, like you get out once you get on the other side of the Mississippi River, where things, or even you know, in Illinois, uh, where things start getting really different really fast. Um, and I started thinking, oh, a rough-legged hawk, obviously up there. Or is it time for broad-winged hawks yet? Is it time? And so I had to like start looking very closely. Uh, at this bird and um yeah i'm glad that you confirmed that it was a red-tailed hawk because um i mean i, I still felt very strongly well, that that what it was but if you and like you and i might have and like you and i were talking before we started said, yeah. uh like mm-hmm. you and i were talking before we started tim uh says i suspect if this beauty had been pure that's exactly silhouette, right that's exactly you wouldn't have thought person, anything but red-tailed Greg. hawk yeah. and that's that's exactly right that's a, yeah and so looking at the shape of the birds as nate was saying you can see Rough legged is just slimmer, longer, yeah, longer, longer wings. wings, much longer kind of hand. Yeah. Um, and when you see them in in when you see them in real life, uh, rough legged hawk has this kind of strange little upward angled wings. They they kind of hold yeah, their wings yeah, in a little their wings yeah. little crook as they Osprey-y. move around. Yeah, um, yeah. So it it gives a very different impression. Um, than than a red tailed hawk uh, or any of the you know the, the beefier beautios, um, so yeah there we go this this bird uh, from Carlisle Illinois is a Harlan's red tailed hawk which is an Arctic subspecies um, that that winters yeah. in the Great Plains um, Southern Great Plains yeah and you know it's it's interesting you mentioned uh, dark face broadwing dark face broadwing um, because. Up until last year, dark, dark Face Broadwing had never been recorded in Illinois, Is and that right? we had a we had a we had an incredible Hawk Watch day. With um, everything was bottled up because we had south winds for weeks, and then we had mm-hmm. this big, big westerly wind event come in, and we had four Broadwing hawks, Dark Face Broadwing hawks, and four Swainson's hawks in one day at, huh. at the Hawk Watch that I was at. 
and just yeah those bro- those dark dark broadies are are further to the west is that right yeah yeah and they winter yeah. like in uh west texas arizona mexico yeah how frequently do you um, see the dark uh rough leggeds because where i live in uh the southeast in north carolina rough legged is annual almost annual somewhere in the state um usually no more than three uh every year um and they are all all light phase birds like we never never I'd, get the dark phase i would phase. say we see like one out of every three or four is a dark phase wow here huh yeah those are cool looking birds that's for sure yeah they really are and then there's like an intermediate too that's um mm-hmm. that's you know from a distance it's dark but as you get closer it's it's you can see more pattern on it yeah. um okay yeah so totally. this one uh, Fort Flag from Fort Flagler, Washington comes from our What's This Bird group on ABA Community, which if you're an ABA member and you haven't checked it out, uh, go just aba.org slash community. Um, there's lots of good stuff happening there. Um, that is our own uh, social media experience. Um, now, the, experience. Uh, the, the, the it's obviously a duck, and to cut to the chase... Um, we're just the observer the was asking if it was a hybrid, mm-hmm. and so this is a this is a common duck um, across most of the ABA area. <laughs> Indeed, it's in the um, <laughs> uh, forgot who I was chatting with for a moment. Um, oh, it's another whole Arctic <laughs> species, for what it's worth. It is, yes, the common yes. ones, yeah. And um, um, so we will we will cut to the chase on the species because the observer wanted to talk about hybrids and we're gonna do that. Um, okay. This is this is a young male common golden eye, um, but let's look at golden eye uh, and what really kind of sets the two species of golden eye common and barrows apart. So, you know, up top here we have the observer's bird in the middle. We have a young Barrow's golden eye that's approximately the same age. Um, and then below an adult male hybrid. And um, really the thing to focus on at this age is the head because the body yeah. plumage can be all over the place. Um, you know, you're, you're gonna see, uh, common golden eye has more white on the back than Barrow's in adult plumage. Um, but at this time of year, when you've got young males, you can discount that, but the head shape, look at the, the size of the bill, how the common golden eyes bill looks like a big rubber boot um, mm-hmm. stuck on the bird's face. And the barrel's golden eye has a much smaller, it's sort of like the difference between a Ross's goose and a snow goose. You know, yeah. it's got that, 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 that smaller. Um, I always think of common golden eye, even at a distance, like that head is almost a perfect equilateral triangle. Yeah. <laughs> it's like good old, good old triangle head. Uh, if we think yeah. of like uh, Gadwall as sort of a block-headed bird, uh, the the peak of a common golden eye, with the com- you know, along with that big old uh, ski slope bill, is yep. um, is very obvious even at a at a very you know long distance, and that's a good way to differentiate not only common golden eye from Barrow's golden eye, which across much of the much of the east, certainly the southeast where I live, is is very rare. Um, but you know, up in the northeast, you get them some somewhat regularly, and then yeah. uh, but also just common golden eye differentiated from every other species of of diving duck. Um, as you can see at great distance, you know that triangle head is going to be um, going to be something that uh, is going to stand out. Absolutely, absolutely. Even when and, diving, and... Sarah Coffee, Sarah Coffee asks, even when diving, yes, even, even when more diving. So. The the we talk about head shape as not the greatest tool for something like a scop, greater for lesser scop, and that is true. When the birds are diving, they can be um, that head shape can kind of be muddled a little bit, so it's not the greatest field mark. But uh, you know that the head shape on the golden eye when they are diving, it is still it remains. Uh, they are triangle yeah. head all the way through. Exactly, and the you know the barrows you can see that the the much stubbier, uh, smaller mm-hmm. bill. But also the the steep forehead, and the yeah. way that forehead just goes straight up. It doesn't look like a continuation yeah. of the bill going up to the 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 corner yeah. of that triangle. And um, Daphne and Rose point out it's that the bill is slope. like a continuation a of a one. forehead. Yeah, ski slope. But then now Very, look at the back diamond ski slope. Look at the difference in the back of the head. How the barrel's golden eye mm-hmm. has what can best be described as a mane. It's got those mm-hmm. long feathers yeah, coming off the back of the head that the common golden eye just doesn't have. 
Mm -hmm. And now look at the hybrid, how it's like right in the middle. Now, yeah, very much. Hybrids can look like anything, um, but typically golden eye hybrids look like this bird on the bottom where the bill shape is kind of in the middle. It's suggestive of both. The head shape is suggestive of both. Um, mm -hmm. It's and the, 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 the pattern on the face is suggestive of both. Mm -hmm. There's no real clear. <laughs> it is right in the middle, isn't it? It's right in the middle. Um, yeah. And those are those are birds that I you know that I feel are safe to call hybrids. There's variation on either end, um, mm -hmm. and when they're in juvenile plumage, you know, transitional plumage, um, that can make it even more difficult. Um, but but that's what you're and identifying hybrids is way harder than identifying species. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, I, I think it's cool how, you know, the common golden eye has the almost perfectly round white spot and the Barrow's golden eye has that crescent shaped white yeah. spot on the face. And the hybrid is like a, it's like a teardrop. Exactly. It's like a perfect halfway between. Uh, it's a cool yeah. picture. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And this one comes to us from Austin, <laughs> Texas and start, start us off on this, Nate. All right. So, um, this bird, I have, a, I have a friend named Steve. He he used to uh, blog on a website called Bourbon Bastards and Birds. Um, I forgot, I've forgotten his last name. He went by Seagull Steve. Uh, and he has this term for birds like this. He calls them brain birds. And they are birds that, um, and it's a term that has always stuck with me, but it's essentially birds for which, like, you know how when you were identifying a bird, you're very familiar with the bird, your brain sort of works seamlessly to kind of get that na bird name to the front of your head uh, as quickly as possible. But every once in a while, you come across a bird that like does not tick any boxes, like it completely short circuits all the neurons, all the bird neurons in your brain. And like you just like are at totally at a loss because it's not something that you expect or considered or anything like that. This bird did that to me. Uh, so, cause I, I, you know, I, I don't live in a place where, where these birds are commonly found. So this bird popped up and I was like, Ooh, sparrow. No, no, it doesn't, doesn't look right for a sparrow. The head is too small. The body's too big. The wings are too long. It doesn't, is it a, is it a horned lark? No, clearly the bill is not right. And so my brain kind of was kind of short circuiting until I went to the next, uh, the next slide where Greg put his comps and, uh, he, he, he revealed it to me. And uh, I was like, oh, yeah, obviously that's what it is. But for a while there, I did not know, you know, where to even go on this bird, which is not an uncommon uh, thing that people who are trying to identify it. Uh, no, I mean, in places. People, they're trying to identify it unless you're in, in a place places where you regularly like, encounter them. Yeah. And well, as, as Seagull Steve would say, birding is hard. Um, mm -hmm. In places where uh, Pintail Wida and Red Bishops, you know, we're talking about Florida, Texas, California. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Females and young always oh, throw people off because people it's, off. you don't even know where to go. <laughs> it's it's like what is this? It doesn't look where like a sparrow. Do it doesn't look like a your field guide. Doesn't look like a finch, and it's not anywhere in the field guide. What the heck do I do with this thing? Um, Interesting thing about this bird, though, and I'm noticing this now because I'm, I'm I'm the bird is in front of my face and I'm, I'm looking sure. at it more commonly. Um, one, this bird, this family of birds used to be considered part of the sparrows. And when you look at them now, I'm like, why the hell did anyone think that it was a sparrow? Because yeah. structurally, it's like way off. And also, I can see its feet and I can see its namesake yes. uh, field mark there on its left foot, which does help me uh, a little bit that this is a um, this is one of the prairie long spurs. And of course, yes. we do have Lapland long spur across the, the continent. So, you know, Lapland longspur, a regular, reasonably common winter bird, yeah. far more common than people see uh, across but most of the lower 48. But um, the other ones are, are birds a... that do not, do not, I do not see them or I even think about them all that much. To be yeah, now honest. Lapland longspur, um, oh, yeah, in, in virtually every plumage, it has rufous, bright rufous in the wings. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so yep. it just, it's that's out the door. But I will confess that when I first saw this bird, and again, this is this is bias. Mm -hmm. I come from the land of Smith's Longspur, and the overall yep. tone and color of this bird was that's like I'm thinking, colored. okay, that's a Smith's Longspur in Texas, uh, Austin, Texas. That would be a good bird. But then I looked at it a second longer, and I'm like, wait, it's not checking boxes right. Um, and so here are the Prairie Longspurs, 
and mm -hmm. uh, our bird in the middle is a chestnut collared. And um, so just to run through them real quick, um, on the left side here, we have a Smith's, um, and you can mm -hmm. see that it's even buffier. The buffy tones yeah. are even richer. Very rich, yeah. Um, but the two things I want to look at are the bit, yeah, overall the head, but in particular the bill shape and size, mm -hmm. um, and the length of the wings, the primaries in particular, you know, the primaries. So the Smith's Longspur has the smallest bill of the three, and yeah, it has this thing. kind of, it has this kind of strange upturned look to it. It's super mm -hmm. subtle, for sure. But yep. it's like once you see it, you can't unsee it. Um, mm -hmm. And it has to do, I think, partially with the the lower mandible, um, or I should say, the mandible being smaller or larger than the upper mandible, mm -hmm. yeah, kinda which is the up. maxilla. And yeah, it, the it first just... time I ever saw Smith's long, sorry, I'm I'm jumping in. There's a, no, there's go a ahead, go ahead. Slight lag that um, the first time I ever saw Smith's long spur uh, was in Southern Missouri, and um, like I crawled around, crawled on my belly to try and get photos of these things as they were walking through the grass, and I got a really nice headshot of one. And that is, you know, it's very obvious that what you say they've got this kind of upturned bill. Um, it's really kind of cool looking. I, it's not something I would have noticed otherwise. Yeah, and it, and it's it's like I said, once you see it, you can't unsee it, but it's really really subtle. Chestnut mm -hmm. collared, you know, the bill is usually darker, um it's heavier, um it's more sparrow-like um and less weird than the Smith's Longspur. Yeah. Um Smith's Longspur also has a pretty noticeable eye ring. Um the face pattern on Smith's Longspur, it's kind of subjective, but Smith's Longspur has a beautiful Male has a beautiful face pattern um, in breeding plumage, and you can see this bird in the picture starting to show a little bit of that. Um, chestnut collared is is kind of in the middle of our three prairie longspurs. Although Smith's is an Arctic longspur, really, it, it it winters in the in the Great Plains, but it it nests way up north in Alaska and and the Yukon Territory. Um, but it's Chestnut collared is not a long distance migrant, whereas Smith's Longspur is. Mm -hmm. So you can see the longer yeah. wings. And I've got some pictures I took of Smith's Longspur. Primary in flight. protection, especially. Look at all those exactly. primaries that that Smith Longspur is showing uh, and how the tertials go almost to the end of the wings in the chestnut collared. That's really interesting. Yeah. And now I wish I wish that uh, Rick Wright was here because there's a, another subtlety that I, I can't remember. And I'm probably going to fudge this and we're all going to look it up later. Um, but there's also a different in in the difference in the primary, I guess it would be called formula, the way that they they lay on top mm -hmm. of each other. So you see how the Smith's long spur there at the bottom, we can see the uh, we can see four of the primaries, and the three that are most evident are fairly evenly spaced, and then the fourth is just kind of sticking its little nose out there. Barely. And barely. notice how the chestnut collared. It's either the second or the third. There's like a there's like a wider a gap, gap there, um, and that's that's a thing. Um, although I'm sure that I fudged that up, so we're all gonna go to uh, uh, pile and and look that up for certain. But but that is a thing. Um, and then getting to the thick build, that is our plainest long spur in this plumage. Yeah, um, it it kind of resembles a field sparrow with a with a pink bill and the eye ring mm -hmm. and just kind of a weird kind of grayish face but but the bill size you know you're not you're not going to mistake that big honking bill um for uh for a smith's long spur that's for sure um and yeah. chestnut collared it's a a little more difficult but thick build in the in in winter plumage you know not on all uh not not alternate base uh plumage and basic plumage is it's real washed out like this and this yeah. bird's pretty mm -hmm. ragged too it is. I was just going to point that out. I don't know if that's a thing that you see this time of year. I, I, I honestly have no idea. Um, this could be like a midsummer or something post breeding bird because it's got. But still, I mean, you're going to see this sort of pale plumage no matter what uh, for yeah. these female type uh, thick builds. And yeah, they're, and they're just much they're grayer overall. Um, they it just they don't show the buffy tones that Smiths and Chestnut huskier do. too. Like just oh the, yeah, the no, profile it's just a bigger, of the bird heftier is huskier, bird. bulkier, shoulder more shouldery. A bigger head, bigger bill, 
Uh, we had a thick-billed longspur that turned up in North Carolina a couple of years ago out on the Outer Banks, and um, it was it was in this winter plumage, this basic plumage, and um, yeah, it was like it it was very striking how pale it was for starters, especially as it was sitting on the dune, um, and just how big and blockheaded the um, the head was compared to Smith's longspur, which is you know the other extreme. Yeah. Manny Majorans uh, asks, uh, where do you get the photos for the comps, Greg? All over the place. All over the place, everywhere. Um, this comes from Palatine, Illinois. And this is a bird that we are seeing a lot of um, this time Good of March year. Bird. Blackbirds are March birds. And blackbirds are one of the first migrants uh, to move through a lot of the ABA area. And, One quick question uh, about long spurs. Sorry, there's some, we're getting comments. Sure, that's and, fine. Uh, I don't want to jump ahead before we get too far out. Uh, legs on the chestnut colored appear to be darker. Is that a thing? Asked Dina Temple. What's I'm sorry. What's the question? The legs on the chestnut colored appear to be darker. Is that an actual thing? Is that a field mark? That I'm not sure of. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Sorry, I can't answer your question, Dina. Yeah, I mean, bare parts. Bare parts coloring is. In some birds, it's diagnostic. In others, um, like pipits, um, uh, American pipit uh, can, you know, it's, it's they have dark legs, darker legs, but I've seen American pipits with pretty pale legs. Um, mm -hmm. Not that you'd ever con confuse it with a Sprague's, which has like, like flesh, like my hand colored legs, um, pretty mm -hmm. bright pink legs, um, yeah. but they can be variable. All right, um, on to the blackbirds. Blackbird so season on to the blackbirds. So, you know, these blackbirds, um, the yellow-eyed blackbirds confuse people. So I thought mm -hmm. we'd just throw a comp together of mm -hmm. yellow-eyed blackbirds and um, just talk about the differences because this is something that, as you said, pops up every year uh, in What's This Bird Like Clockwork right around now um, when the blackbirds are flocking up and moving through. Um, and they they look like this too. They look like they're kind of halfway between winter plumage and and uh, summer plumage, basic and alternate, uh, like this bird here does. It's uh, all, you know all over glossy black. These birds are moving. They're singing, um, but there's a little bit of some brown edging on the feathers there. Um, we can talk about why that is. Yeah, um, well, you know, we can we can this. identify this bird before we get to the comp. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot uh, that would identify this bird pretty quickly if you're familiar with it. And as Nate said, the I'm going to just say it, rusty uh, no, edging no. on the back That's feathers. A <laughs> there's, um, a there's a reason. There's a reason for that. Um, <laughs> is, is kind of a giveaway. But the other thing is the habitat. Um, mm -hmm. oh, that that sure. kind of swampy woodland edge. Um, you know, on a moss covered, yeah. on a moss covered log by the edge of still water, that yeah. is that habitat is pure rusty blackbird. Uh, um, absolutely true. That is that is where you find them often deep in. It's weird sometimes. A you'll be or a, you'll be yeah. deep in the woods and you'll find a seep, and there'll mm -hmm. be rusty blackbirds in there and just like yeah, like a small flock of them. Yeah, way away from where you yep. think you might find blackbirds, but they'd be rusties in there and um you know the short the short tail and the and the small thin bill um yep different from all grackles. make this a rusty blackbird but we can talk yep. about how they uh compare to the other yellow-eyed blackbirds and um so you could see you know, these are in these are in basic plumage these are in breeding plumage um mm -hmm. so we're really looking at gestalt uh here and um Although in breeding plumage, rusty blackbird has kind of a flat black coloration. And in that flat black coloration, and I'm going to pop back here and see if we can see it in this bird. Um, boy, we, we may be a little bit, but the lighting is making it hard to see. A little glossier, um, yeah. But, well, no, that's not what I was going for. Um, one of the things that, that, rusty blackbird in in winter plumage and if you look at the um look at the field guides or look at pictures on macaulay or other places 
it kind of has like a blackish mask. It has a dark mm. mask uh, around the eye, sort of like a, um, well, so many birds that have little dark sort of masks around the eye. And you can kind of see that here in this picture of a rusty blackbird that right around the eye, the lures and everything the darkest are yeah. blacker than the rest of the bird. But the rest mm -hmm. of the bird is kind of a dull gloss, like it's a satin, it's not a high gloss paint. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Brewer's blackbird is high gloss. That is a purple, paint. that bird is purple and glossy, um, but the bill yeah. is heavier. Um, mm -hmm. The habitat the tail's a little bit longer. The tail is a little is bit very longer. Very different. Habitat is usually very different. Although during yeah. migration, you will see them all together out in the fields, picking through the corn, uh, the corn stubble, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Brewer's blackbird often walks with its tail cocked up in the air, um, yep. and you can also tell them apart when they're looking close to this plumage by the females because the the female brewers. Yeah are gray um, yeah, and have dulcer, dark eyes. And the yep. female rusties are rusty and have yellow eyes. And so if yep. you see like three or four female brewers hanging out together in the field, look at the males around them. They're probably going to be brewers too. Yeah. Um, uh, brewers blackbird acts and, you know, just behaves just generally like a small grackle almost much more yeah. than a rusty, which is like something that is actually quite different. And, you know, brewers blackbird pre predominantly a, a Western, uh, Western species on the Western half of the continent. Um, you know, it's a pretty typical parking lot bird, uh, roadside rest stop, that sort of thing. Whereas rusty blackbirds will be um, you know, in a swamp, in a in a wooded area, and these seeps that we that we see, like Greg pointed out, yep. when when we do get what brewers blackbirds in the east, which does happen regularly, um, they they don't they are not typically in the same places except when they are in those sort of large mixed in with those large flocks. A lot of times, brewers blackbirds will hang out at like uh, livestock pens and whatnot, cattle um, feed lots, picking through. Yeah, they love those. Uh, and in yeah. rusty blackbirds, you you'll never find in the winter. Uh, in those now, stores. what's interesting is we have here in Northeast Illinois Almost a never. tiny, a tiny little disjunct <laughs> population of breeding Brewers Blackbirds at Illinois Beach oh, really? State Park, and it's probably mm. like I don't know seven pair, ten pair, um, mm. and they're just out in the dunes and they live out there in the summertime and yeah, but you know nowhere else in Illinois will you find uh, Brewers Blackbirds. Um, and and uh, John Lowry is pointing out that brewers also nest in Michigan in small numbers in Jack Pine. So yeah, they do have these tiny huh, little, um, kind of like Swainson's hawk. You know, Illinois has yeah, a few yeah. pairs of Swainson's hawk that are just way away from the rest of Swainson's hawk. Yeah, range. Missouri is the same way. Um, yeah, where I grew up in Missouri, there's some in, in Southwest Missouri and Springfield, a couple of nests. So so you know, getting Swainson's back to the hawk, comp here, right. um, you can really see the difference between the two grackles and the two blackbirds. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the common grackle uh, is yeah, one of the most common birds in the eastern half of the ABA area. Um, unless you're in Texas, where great tail grackle definitely takes over. Um, or a lot but, right on the immediate coast where boat tailed grackle <laughs> takes over. Right. And I didn't, I was going to say, I didn't put boat tailed in here um, because it's right in between the two and it often has a dark yeah. eye and part of the population. Yes. Um, but yeah, yeah, bow tailed grackle is is kind of like right in between the two, um, common and gray tail. But you can really see why great tailed grackle is given its name. Um, you Tail's know, there's pretty great. There's really it is, and there's there's really when you get a decent look at the bird, there's really no confusing a common grackle for a rusty or a brewer's blackbird. Um, you know, even yeah, the females, you know, common just, grackle with that big old keel shaped long long tail. Uh, very distinct compared to our other smaller blackbirds, yeah. which are more like red wing blackbird in, in structure, though the bills typically are a little bit a little bit slimmer. Yeah. So why uh, why does that rusty blackbird in the initial photo retain some of those uh, rusty margins on their feathers, Greg? Well, those will be gone. Um, those yep. will be gone by May, and those those wear off. Um, and a bunch of birds it's the tips. Um, yep. It's the tips. It's the fringes of the feathers. Uh, they have these, uh, when they molt, they have these broad, rusty uh, tips on, on all their feathers or a lot of their feathers. It forms a pattern on, on the bird, actually. Um, and then over the course of months, it wears off so that when they get to breeding plumage, or at least what mm -hmm. we call breeding plumage, um, they're nice and 
nice and uh, glossy. I was going to say glossy, but they're not. They're they satiny they're, black. He's <laughs> satiny. All right, fair enough. They're they nice are. and uh, dark. Yep. They are. Um, they're eggshell. Greg. They are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. You're taking me back to my days working retail where we had to remember all those colors. <laughs> oh, yeah. We did some eggshell is different here, from so. taupe. It's different from... Anyway. Yep. Um, <laughs> Uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, Florida. Yeah, there's a lot Land of birds of that look... big, white wading birds. There's a lot of birds that look like this around St. Petersburg, Florida. Sure are. Um, sure are. The thing that stands out about this bird, because I mean, we could kind of, you know, we've all walked along the edges of ponds and we know how big the the plants are uh, at the edge of the pond that it's walking on. It's walking sort of on a beach there. Um, this is a massive bird. <laughs> I mean, this is a chonker too. This is a Thick. pterodactyl. <laughs> yeah. You know, so some of the other white birds, there's, there's a whole bunch of white herons and egrets. There's white ibis. There's wood stork, which is another massive uh, pterodactyl of a bird, but there's no confusing uh, wood stork for any heron. They just have that, huge no. you know cudgel of a bill um, and a bald head Sometimes and a bald head be. yeah so i mean yeah you can just get rid of that um so really we're in the herons and egrets here and um in in south florida um the uh, the great blue heron has two subspecies uh or one subspecies sorry um the great white heron and then the um, more typical uh, great blue heron. And, There's also Werdemann's heron. Oh, Werdemann's, which, no which is a it's hybrid a species or a hybrid swarm, or I, it's a, I it's a think mess. that I think Werdemann's is a hybrid. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if the great blue herons are split um, yeah. at well, some point. Great blue and great white are split. It was a proposal at some point. a couple of years ago. Yeah, and. Um, so let's let's compare uh, this great white heron with a great egret, which is um, that is the that is the pair where the confusion happens. The two large and, uh, Ardea, yep, waiting birds. Yeah. So the thing that stands out to me, uh, as you said, Greg, there's just a, a heft, uh, apparent heft to the the bird in question, uh, the bird on the right here. Yep. Uh, that is not apparent in great egret. Great egret's a, a big egret. It's a big heron, um, but they are they have a delicate feel to them. They have a very slender neck, a very small head, a, a good size bill. But you know, great blue heron and you know great white heron also. It is a massive railroad spike of a bill, and it's just a big old thick neck and a big head that is just completely very you know quite different than a than a great egret. And yeah, and it's the the color of the head, the color of the bill for me as well. So we're looking at a, a kind of a two toned bill, just a little bit kind of yellowy gray on the upper mandible and yellow on the lower one compared to the yellow bill of the great egret. And uh, the leg color is another thing that we're going to be looking at. This photo doesn't show it that well. I think it's a little uh, the the light must have been quite harsh when this photo was taken, and so the legs yeah. are a little bit shadier. But uh, great egret has uh, black legs black legs all the way through whereas these great white herons and, and great blue herons also they're more kind of a grayish almost sometimes tending towards yellowish a little bit you can see it they're they're pale uh as on this bird compared to the the great eagle it's just it's a bigger bird if they're standing side by side and there's not barely a place in florida where you're not going to see multiple species of white herons standing side by side it's going to be the biggest one on the block it's going to be the biggest oh bird. yeah by uh, far, great blue herons are are uh, our largest herons and uh, bigger again, you know, maybe fifty percent larger than most great egrets. Yeah, and uh, Gavin asks about reddish egret, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't. I mean, reddish egret is it is it is another one of the white herons, um, but but you know, like the other the smaller white herons, there's little blue and and cattle mm -hmm. egret and and it's kind of between those. It, yeah, it's well. Sense it's it's pretty distinctive um it's you know it's got this long black sinister dagger of a bill uh yeah and it, adults have a, a sharply bicolored bill flesh colored at the mm -hmm. base with a black tip um but it's also got a different a different shape 
um, than than great egret uh, or or great white heron. Um, so you you know you would you would be more probably snowy egret and white reddish egret would be yeah more they're, or they're or maybe great egret and white but but not great white heron and great egret. Um, no. It, it doesn't no, fit in the middle or, or in with those two. And, you know, John, you were just talking about leg color. And one thing to, you know, one thing to remember about leg color um, and, a, and face color in herons is that it's controlled by hormones. And so, I mean, like that, that great egret in when it's breeding, its this face is going to be, actually. yeah, it's going to, its face is going to be neon green. And yeah, it's it, cool. They're quite spectacular. And, the, the 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 base of the bill the face and the legs can really change depending on what kind of hormonal state they're in but yeah great egret has black or blackish legs and great white heron um has the more sort of fleshyish not quite as black um as as the egret a lot of times this time of year, uh, a lot of those egrets are going to be showing some breeding filaments too. So they've got these very fine feathers yeah. that are coming out of their, in the case of great egrets, kind of out of the body um, that are, you know, they, they have for a very relatively brief period of time to, as part of their display. Um, you know, more famously, the snowy egrets have these kind of feathery things that go off the sides of their, their heads that are all, you know, very elaborate. But uh, great, egret, great white heron, uh, great blue heron doesn't have as much of that. Um, but I, and, and, and nice. you know, we were talking about silhouettes earlier with the with the hawks. I mean, if you just you know imagine this uh, great white heron on the right as silhouette, you would immediately mm-hmm. identify it as a great blue heron, um, yeah, because of the size of the bill and the little crest and just you know yeah. just how massive it appears, um, and and not not as as sort of slim and elegant uh, like the great egret. Sure. We have another question about blackbirds, just real briefly before we move on. Sure. Uh, Greg. Uh, Sarah Coffey asks another question about brewers. If they are in a flock of blackbirds, but it is a cloudy day, does that glossy shine still stand out? I, to a certain degree, yes. Yeah. Another thing to note about uh, brewers blackbird versus the grackles that they might be hanging out with, too, is that grackles typically have two, are kind of two-toned. Uh, at least the ones in the west, right? Because the purple grackle that's in the east and the bronze grackle that's in the uh, the right. west, it's the grackles that kind of have a purplish head, but they have kind of like a coppery iridescence right. on the body, um, whereas the brewer's blackbird would be kind of uniformly iridescent across the entire body. It's another sort of thing to look for. Yeah, and I, and brewer's blackbird, it, it's a little bit more blue than purple. Um, yeah, although, blue, although you know, like the turquoise. The... the, the, the um, uh, the the science of iridescent feathers is uh, we could spend a whole hour just talking about that. Yeah, it's structural, um, but and it if you're not on familiar with how yeah. iridescent feathers work and how we see those colors, especially things like hummingbird gorgets, um, mm-hmm. get on the Google and look at that because it'll blow your mind, and yeah, it'll blow cool. your mind even more when you we, you see that birds, especially birds like hummingbirds and birds of paradise, they understand how that structural um the yeah. structure of the feathers reflects light back at the viewer yeah. and they understand the position of the light source yeah they know where in to relation themselves. to the viewer yep. and they can literally aim the color at the viewer which is what they do during breeding where they aim mm-hmm. that color at the female the males aim you know so it's like i i remember the 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 recent um um documentary about the birds of paradise where they had to rig this camera to hang directly above the displaying bird of paradise because from the side they're looking at this bird display and the gorget is black and it's displaying and it's Mm -hmm. looking up and the female is sitting directly overhead looking straight down at the male so they put a camera above her and from her point of view that gorget was like yeah. a spectacular neon green, yeah. <laughs> just like boom. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that's uh, that too. Frequently. Yeah, it's it's an amazing it's an amazing thing. A couple questions regarding uh, great white herons and distribution. Uh, Cindy uh, Glasgow Breidenbach asked, "Do the great white and great blue herons have the same range?" Um, no, they do not. They overlap in um, in Florida primarily. 
Uh, great white heron is the more common of the birds throughout the Caribbean and northern South America. Uh, but great blue heron is the one that we have throughout most of continental U.S. and um, in Canada. Um, they yeah. do. Great white heron does have uh, some pattern of vagrancy. They will show up far to the north. We've had them throughout the southeast uh, every once in a while. And I'm, I'm pretty sure they've made it up as far as like Ohio, Kentucky uh, before into the Midwest and Kentucky. Yeah. So they, they will vagrate. And, you know, that's relevant if you if they ever split them and you're a chaser or a lister and you oh, want yeah. to check that out. Uh, maybe maybe next time one shows up, you should go get that in the bank uh, for the for the split. Uh, but Absolutely. for the most part, the uh, the the two populations uh, overlap in South Florida. Um, that's where you see both of them. But to the north, it's great blue heron. To the south, it's primarily great white heron uh, throughout throughout the Caribbean. This little one comes from Foley, Alabama. And, um, hummingbird season. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's always hummingbird season along the Gulf. <laughs> um, and okay. So right off the bat, we can say that this is not a ruby throated hummingbird, which is yeah. the expected species, the, at least the most common species in Alabama. Um, but this, and the angle's doing why, a little bit of work here, but not ruby. that much. Um, the fact that the bird is fluffed up is doing a little bit more here. But this bird almost looks like a caricature of a hummingbird. It's just yeah, so round and cute and just... And remember that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it screams Salasphorus to me when I look at this bird. And, uh, you know, I've seen... His, I live in the East, uh, as do you, Greg. We have seen thousands of ruby-threaded hummingbirds over the course yeah. of our birding life. We sort of have a, you know, internalized idea of what that bird looks like. They tend to have kind of narrow head, narrow neck, a smaller head. They've got a longer curved bill, more curved yep. bill, I should say, uh, that gives them a very distinct profile. And this bird just does not have it. It is chunky. No. It is bull-necked. It's got a relatively short bill, and so when I look at it, I I think this is this is a Salasphorus, which is the genera genus of hummingbirds that is found. Uh, you know, there's several different species that are found in the American West. The most common of which uh, is Rufus hummingbird, but also Allen's hummingbird, broad-tailed, and Calliope. I could not identify this this bird to that two species within the genus Salasphorus, but I can tell you, it is um, it is it is not a well, ruby-throated to me or any of the Ar no. Archilochus hummingbirds, which is also um, black chin yep and um you know those those bird they are hard to tell apart um mm -hmm. and what were the females and there's the and there's a bunch of different ways there's 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 the shape of the the, the wingtips which we the primaries mm -hmm. um which we can see here fairly well that we're yeah we probably not going to get into too much i want to talk more about gestalt um with those birds that you were uh just talking about and the bird that we have here on the feeder. I'm going to back up to it just a second. This is a calliope hummingbird. And I it's it. um, it's a rare bird in Alabama. And um, people are going to see it. Um, the person who posted the picture posted it asking, did I get it? <laughs> it's like, yes, you <laughs> did get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So looking at the at the birds that, that Nate mentioned, um, we have calliope on the left. We've got Rufus in the middle. We've got broad-tailed. Uh, on the right and of the three the calliope has the shortest tail and just overall mm -hmm. it's as By Nate far. was describing it's it's really compact um it's mm -hmm. the head is big the body is small in comparison um and the short tail all adds up to this this really compact bird and the bill is usually shorter and looks you know more needle-like than either Rufus Allens or Broadtailed. Um, for the mm -hmm. sake of this discussion, Rufus and Allens are basically the same. Them together. <laughs> um, in this, yeah, I mean that's that's above that's above pay grade for this discussion. Um, I need a and really, those those Sherry birds Williamson are we need her. they're they're ninety nine percent identified in the hand um, yeah. by Banders, uh, but you know, extra limital Rufus and Allens. Um, but in the middle. So I chose this pose of Rufus Hummingbird. This is something that I've noticed. I, I've seen a lot of um, Rufus Hummingbirds in Illinois. Uh, they've become a 
regular fall Mm -hmm. winter bird um in in illinois we get a few every year and the thing that i notice about rufus hummingbird um when it's sitting at the feeder is that that the tail and the wings form this sort of point a triangle um Mm -hmm. that uh ruby-throated just doesn't and calliope certainly does not and Mm -hmm. Um, that it's 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 a little bit it's a little bit longer. It's not as big headed as the calliope, and then we get to the broad tailed, um, and the broad tailed is just a big lanky. It's a long lanky bird, um, and Sherry Sherry Williamson, who wrote the Hummingbird Guide, once said to me, "Think Keanu Reeves." <laughs> John Wick. Uh, but yeah, just, it's a long, tall, thin, I mean, this is all in comparison (laughs) to the other hummingbirds. Um, it's, it's got a long tail and if you see it in flight, it's got a broad tail, you know, Calliope has, uh, this, the, the central, the central tail feather is, uh, uh, and well, the tail feathers in the middle are, are shorter than the outer tail feathers. So when it, when it's coming into the feeder and spreading its tail, it's it's like your hand it's just it's it's kind of just flat across the bottom it looks cut off yeah it does like uh there's supposed to be something there and there isn't yeah and um yeah so that's that's really what i wanted to point out there was the 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 gestalt of those three species in winter Mm -hmm. or juvenile plumage and um just how the you know we had a broad tail the first broad tailed hummingbird in illinois uh last year and it was it, when I saw the pictures. Summer, this past when I saw the pictures of it, the first pictures that were you know of it, at any quality, you could immediately see that long shape. There was one one yeah. picture where it was just about to land on the feeder with kind of long neck and a big broad tail. Really yeah. doesn't look anything like a Rufus at all um, when you can uh, get it, a it, good look at it. Yeah. For sure, and you know, just to for the purposes of most people who live in the east, it, they, these all these birds have a very distinctive shape, uh, and different from you know ruby throated, which is the bird you're gonna see. Uh, ruby throated yes. always to me is very, um, like very flat headed, yep. and the bill like almost comes like right off the top of the head and kind of curves a little bit, whereas all these sort of salaspharas have a very rounded head that makes the head look bigger, and um, you know the bill is more or less straight. Um, you know, ruby throated is almost always going to have a little more of an arc to the bill than a lot yeah. of these. Sort and of straight, and you'll notice that all three of these birds, ones. all three of these birds show speckled throats, which ruby throated mm-hmm. usually doesn't. If it doesn't, does, be clean. Yep. it's just for a very, very brief time. Um, the throat is usually clean, but also all three of these birds show some amount of rufous uh, or buff color underneath whether it's the under tail coverts whether it's the flank whether it's the base of the tail um mm-hmm. they're all going to have some amount of buff color ruby throated yeah. can have a little bit of rufusy brown at the base of the tail in some plumage um plumages but really not on the body so much yeah um yeah, they're pretty and, sharply uh, demarcated between that kind of bronzy green on the back and kind of whitish dirty yeah. white on the front um yeah that's that's a good one yeah, yeah pay attention Alex to those ruby throated the they're coming short. back if you're in the east yeah and this is yeah, sort we of uh you know we always try to get across the aba area and even though this bird was in the east where we're here discussing discussing western birds um mm-hmm. and uh so we kind of checked that box off um absolutely you get a lot more that's... opportunity to uh look at hummingbird diversity in the west than we do uh, oh, absolutely. East. We're always staring at our ruby throated, waiting for that one that looks slightly different. Um, and typically that's a winner, winner sort of thing. So, yeah. So, you know, so we, we are run up on the hour here, Nate. Um, we did it. We did it. I, uh, we did it again. Uh, I want to remind everybody that if you uh, enjoy what we do, you enjoy this program. If you enjoy the best uh, natural history bird uh, and birding podcast out there, no. the American Birding Podcast with uh, your Nate, your host Nate Swick. Um, yep. Join the club every Thursday. Be a, be a member and help support all of this, and you'll also get our magazines. You'll get access to ABA community. Um, we've got a couple of other things up our sleeves that uh, we think you're going to enjoy um, coming up. And uh, as I said at the and outset, while you're at it, 
Oh no! Do do the what you said at the outset. As I, I said at the outset, you get discounts from our friends. Oh yeah. Um, ABA members that. have there's perks involved. Absolutely. Um, you know, and if you're on uh, social media, please consider liking the ABA uh, on Facebook and YouTube. You can subscribe to us on YouTube, uh, and you'll be able to get a, a notation whenever we we go live. We'll be back in a couple weeks. Smash that like button and uh, subscribe. <laughs> and uh Smash that you know, join it helps button. our numbers i'm not entirely sure uh exactly how it helps our numbers uh other than making them go up by like two or three but uh well and it makes know, us feel every good. everything helps it makes us feel good yeah <laughs> so, so validate our <laughs> our 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 egos here and uh help us out by subscribing to uh the aba's youtube feed facebook page and of course joining the american birding association um, yep and, and then, uh, we'll, we'll be back we'll see you at aba community in a couple weeks yeah hopefully we'll be back in two weeks uh yep. to talk more about birds and birding and uh, until then hope you have a great uh, great spring and uh go tar heels <laughs>